Okay. The first five minutes are going to be the hardest, and then I'm going to get on a roll. So <laughs> I've got a lot of notes, but the good news is, is I printed it really big so I could see it without my glasses, so it's really not as much as it looks like. So um, yeah, spiritual disciplines in the context of marriage and motherhood. So um, first of all, we want to ask what are spiritual disciplines, and so this is a very simple definition. Biblical practices that a believer does to grow spiritually in Christ and to build their relationship with him. If you Google it, you'll find all kinds of different lists of what should be included on that list. Um, and lots of people have written books about it and study guides and blogs and podcasts. But I um, just decided I'll touch on these seven basics. Prayer, Bible study, and fasting are the, the pillars. Journaling, worship, memorization, and discipleship, I think, are also really important. But there's lots of other things that could be included. These are just the ones that we women can really do. You know, like we're not in charge of our charitable giving, usually, um, or where we fellowship, or things like that so much. So these are the, the ones that are under our control as wives and mothers and as women. And um, in the context of marriage and motherhood was the um, assignment that was given to me, if you will. But I know that there's a lot of you here that aren't married and you're not mothers, and that's fine. I think a whole bunch of what I'll have to say will be very applicable to your life just exactly where you are. But um, I'm going to be unapologetic about the fact that that is kind of the context in which we're talking. So um, maybe you'll be married, or maybe you'll be a mother someday, or maybe you won't. Either way, that's fine. Um, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. So that'll be the context. Um, and then also, you know, we could have dropped the S on spiritual disciplines and just made this a talk on spiritual discipline because um, I'm going to touch a little bit on some practical things, but I'm also just going to talk about the benefits of being spiritually disciplined. Um, and I've got a lot of material, and I'm hoping we're going to get through it all and still leave time for us to hear from you. Um, but I don't want to overwhelm anyone. I don't expect that all of this is going to apply to any one person here. I want you to kind of go through and pick up the nuggets that apply to you, um, even if it's just a phrase or a single thought, something that's going to bring you courage like next Monday um, or two weeks from now when something just hits you, you know, right in the face that you weren't expecting. So that's the goal here. All right, I'm going to start, since nobody really knows me, with a um, very brief bio. The reason I have a picture of that sign there, um, that was the ice cream sign that my husband and I might, met under 38 years ago. He owned an ice cream shop, and I went to work for him. And um, it was the ice cream shop closed, went out of business, and the sign was forgotten. And a um, number of years later, we found it at the back of his dad's barn, and we hung it up in our house. And it has been a reminder for me ever since that my primary role, since I said I do, is I am Mike's. I'm Mike's wife, the father of Mike's children, and now as he ages, I'm Mike's helper. And so that's the context of my life. And there's some pictures of my family, I should just say very briefly, um, that we, both my husband and I, were raised in non-Christian homes. Um, we were born again a year after we got married, um, which is 32 years ago now. Um, after about 10 years of walking with the Lord and the Lord graciously discipling us, we decided to move to North Carolina to a more conservative church. That was our first introduction to anybody like you all. Um, and after being there for 17 years, we moved to Ohio, which is where we live now. We go to a very small church called Remnant Christian Fellowship that's not affiliated with anybody in particular. We're a pretty eclectic little group, but we are happy there. So that's our brief bio. Oh, and I have 12 children. Most of them still live with me. Um, yeah. One is about to be married, one is married. 
I will say this, everyone in my household is potty trained. They can all tie their shoes, they can all read. I'm down to homeschooling only four students, and uh, many of my children do have a sincere and growing relationship with the Lord. So from this stage of life, I can look back and I am so humbled. And um, you know, when I look around at some of you young moms with your babies in arms and your toddlers and you're trying to get them to sit still through these sessions and everything, I am just so glad that I'm through that stage and I made it. Some of you older women are like, yes, I know what you mean. But I am so humbled. Um, that God carried me through, and I am just so confident that he will carry you through too. And um, that's kind of, yeah, Lamentations 3.20 says, my soul hath them in, still in remembrance and is humbled in me. And, um, and it goes on in the next verse to talk about hope. When I recall these things, it just gives me hope for the rest of you. So, um, yeah, in regards to the spiritual disciplines, um, most of us know what we're supposed to do, um, but I think most of us would also agree that there's higher ground, and the problem is not our good intentions. The problem is summed up here in Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart faileth. And the answer is this, God is the strength of my heart. So what does the Bible have to say about um, the spiritual disciplines? I think I mentioned that there is no biblical list of what you're supposed to do to be a good Christian on a daily basis. But it does say in 1 John 2, 6, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So how did um, Jesus walk out the disciplines? What do we see from scripture? Um, I'm not going to do an extensive Bible study, so you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to point out a few things. Um, in Luke 6, 12, it says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. There's lots of verses that tell us that Jesus prioritized prayer. Even though he had a busy day of ministry, he often went aside and prayed. It also says in Luke 9, 23, um, and he said to them, this is Jesus talking, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So apparently Jesus really expected that this Christian life would require a daily denial of ourselves. Um, interesting that this was all said before the crucifixion and he said you need to take up your cross daily and follow me. I'll touch on being a living sacrifice later, but you know, he wasn't talking about dying for Christ. I hope we're all willing to do that, but he's talking here about us being willing to just go through life carrying a cross. And um, that's going to be probably more needful for all of us than just dying a martyr's death. And sometimes it's a little harder. And then in Matthew 22, 29, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, ye, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. In other words, Jesus was implying that if you don't know the word of God and haven't tapped into God's power, you're going to be in error. You're going to wind up erring. And then in Luke 10, 41 and 42, Jesus seems to be specifically speaking to us, mothers who are very busy, and he says, Martha, Martha, or Marielle, Marielle, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So what was that really good thing that Mary was doing that he commended? She was sitting at Jesus' feet, and Jesus is saying here that is the most important thing that you need to do. And I know some of you are going, oh, I know and I'd love to, and if I just had an hour a day to spend at his feet, that would be great. Um, I, I get that. And if it were really an either or thing, like either I spend time devoted to God or I have a clean house, or either I spend time devoted to God or I can homeschool my children, or you, know, you put anything in there, even if it was really that cut and dried, it would be worth it, according to Jesus Christ, to spend time at his feet.
That's what it says. And I have found that that's the way it is. If I prioritize prayer, if I prioritize spending time with God, it actually goes better, you know, homeschooling. It goes better doing the dishes. It goes better discipling my teens. It, everything goes better. So it's not an either or, but even if it was, it would still be a priority to spend time at Jesus' feet. So here's a few Greek words just to make myself look really intellectual. I, I like these. Orthodoxy is the Greek word that, that talks about what we believe. Orthopraxy is what we do. It's our practice. And so what we believe needs to turn into what we practice or what we do. That's what the spiritual disciplines are going to do. Pistis means faith. Pistos means faithful. Pistis is a noun. It's a person, place, thing, or idea. Pistos is an adjective. It modifies nouns, right? So what we have becomes what we are. Faith needs to become faithful. So sanctification is the goal of spiritual disciplines. And sanctification is a journey. And sanctification is also something really kind of unique. Um, sometimes you'll hear the phrase progressive sanctification. It's the only part of the Christian life that we partner with God in. He does the saving. We can't save ourselves and our works can't save us. And he does the glorification. He will justify us and translate us in the end. But in between salvation and glorification is what we call progressive sanctification, and we partner with God in that process. And, yeah, we partner with God. We can, we can cooperate with him or we can slow him down. It's not an event. It doesn't happen at a particular day. Our salvation, our progressive sanctification starts on a particular day. And it's nice if you know what that date is. But, but sanctification is not an event. And it's not a to-do list. It's not like we can go, okay, sanctification, check, did that. And it's also not a race. We are not going to get anywhere if we're just looking around saying, I think I'm doing better than her, or I think I'm doing worse. It's not a race. What sanctification is, is it's a walk. And I just was struck with this realization of several weeks ago that when Jesus walked on the water that time, when he came to his disciples and they were in the midst of the sea, he had been on the mountain praying, and I looked at a map, and, you know, based on where he had been preaching and where he probably went into the wilderness or up into the mountains to pray and where the midst of the sea was, it's probably several miles from the mountaintop to the midst of the sea. So he, after a very busy day of ministry and then an all night of prayer, he stands up and he walks down the mountain and across the seashore, gets to the water, and he keeps walking on the water. And that was an amazing miracle, wasn't it? But he walked. He had to put in the effort and do the walking. And I think that's exactly what it's like for us as sisters. Um, you know, God is going to do the miracles. He's going to make the water hold us up. But we have got to do the walking. It's a walk. And it's a walk along a very narrow way. And there are ditches on both sides. And I don't care what issue you want to look at, you can fall off onto this ditch and you can fall off into that ditch. And some of us are more prone to go down one ditch than the other, but we are all vulnerable on all sides. And when we're overcorrecting from falling on this ditch, we're especially vulnerable to fall into that other ditch. So it's a very narrow way and it can be very challenging. Um, I just think of the context of being a wife and mother. I mean, we've got to eat, but we need to not give in to gluttony. We need to fast, but we have to prepare food for our family. We have to push ourselves to do our very best, and yet we need to not become proud. 
We have to endure suffering and yet not give in to despair. I mean, we're just constantly walking that narrow way. But God gives us the grace to do it. All right, I just want to very quickly go through um, those seven things I had on the board, prayer and whatever on the slide. Um, This is not a how-to. There are so many really, really good resources and probably so much wisdom in this room. If you're somebody who, after I go through these next seven slides, says, I need more specifics, go find an older sister, and I'm sure there's lots of information they can give you, but I'm just going to give a couple little pointers on some of these disciplines. So prayer, I find that um, the two major challenges in prayer is finding the time and being able to stay focused. Um, When it comes to time, I think it's really important that we incorporate prayer into the rhythms of our life. Um, If you're not at a season where you can spend a lot of time set aside for prayer, then pray for things as you're going through your day. And it will disciple your children and be a blessing to all the people around you. Um, Yeah, when you hear of a need, stop and pray for it. Don't just say, oh, I'll pray for you, because the reality is, is if you actually set a time aside in your prayer closet to pray for all the things you say to people, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you, there's no way you'd get anything done, right? And so just go ahead and say, well, can we pray for that right now? And do it. And, And it's a great way also to deal with gossip. When somebody comes to you and they're just going on and on and on about, you know, kind of tearing a situation or a person down, You know, listen compassionately for a little while and then say, you know, since you brought that up, can we just stop and pray about that? And it's amazing. People who really didn't want to pray for the situation but just wanted to talk about it, they don't come to you anymore, and it's wonderful. (laughs) The other thing we can do is the Bible says to pray without ceasing. So what does that look like? Well, I realized just recently, it's kind of embarrassing to say this is recent, but I realized that I have this running conversation going on in my head all the time. I'm I'm constantly like rehearsing a conversation that I had with my husband or that I want to have with a sister or whatever. And I was just like, why don't I take those thoughts captive? Why don't I make that running conversation in my head a conversation with God? And then it will be praying without ceasing. And it's working. It's amazing. Then there's also um, intentional set-aside prayer. And um, my daughter, Isabel, pointed out that if we are faithful in the intentional times of prayer, it makes the praying without ceasing a lot easier. And I have found that definitely to be the case. But there's no certain amount of time that you need to set aside for prayer. Um, Yeah, different seasons of life require different things and and will allow you more time or less. Okay, so then the second thing is focus. Um, Here's just a little couple things that I find helpful. Um, I set a timer on my phone and I set it for one minute and I start praying for the first oldest member of my family and just about the time when I'm either starting to fall asleep or my mind is starting to wander, my little timer goes off, and I switch to the next person on my list. And so that's very helpful. You can also write out your prayers. Um, You can journal your prayers. You can pray scripture. The other thing that's helpful is if you take your your distracted thoughts um, captive by doing this and say to yourself, okay, this thought keeps coming into my prayer time. Take it captive. Don't just try and get rid of it. Take it captive and look at it and say, is this something that God wants me to pray about? Or is this something I'm really concerned about? Is it something that's bothering my conscience? What do I need to do with this distracted thought that keeps coming back? And then lastly, I'll just say this, that the Bible does say a few things about um, the morning. In Psalm 5.3, it says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. I know that some people are morning people and some people are not, and that's fine. I'm a morning person. The way I prioritize my day is anything that's really important that has to be done, it gets done before noon. Um, So I pray in the morning. But even if you're not a morning person, and even if you can't do a whole bunch of prayer in the morning, it is a great time for you to at least start your day thinking about God. Just swing your feet over the edge of the bed and say, okay, Lord, 
how do you want me to do today? Just, just start there. Start the conversation in the morning. I really like this quote, which isn't there. It's a good reminder that, you know, intercessory prayer is, is another really important kind of prayer. And um, we are our children's and our husband's primary intercessor. And what intercessory prayer does is it, it's penetrating the hearts we cannot open, shielding those we cannot guard, teaching where we cannot speak, comforting where our words have no power to soothe. No ministry is so like that of an angel as this, silent, invisible, known but to God. It's a very pure ministry. There's no pride in it at all. Okay, the Bible. It's the very bedrock of our faith. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So therefore, I say we should study it zealously, meditate on it deeply, and communicate it accurately. It's, it's just really important, and I could go on and on, but I'm not going to for the sake of time. Fasting. I think what regular fasting does is it helps us reset our priorities. It helps us better appreciate the things that we easily take for granted. And um, we usually associate that with food, giving up food. Um, I don't know about any of you ladies, but while I was in the childbearing years, I was either pregnant or nursing most of the time. And I don't think I ever went a single day where I fasted all day. I just couldn't, so I didn't. But I found out that there's lots of other ways you can fast. You can give up um, snacks or desserts, or sometimes our family would do like just a family rice fast where I wouldn't have to think about what to make because we just had three meals of rice, and the children could have rice with milk for breakfast, and they could have rice with you know, sprinkled cheese on it for lunch and for supper, and they loved it. And if anybody actually absolutely had to eat, you can have your rice, and other than that, we're fasting, you know, and it's kind of simple. Um, but there's other things to fast from besides food. I found through the busy years, I fasted from books and magazines. I just didn't have any time. I felt like, how could I possibly sit down and read this really good, wholesome book, um, or this great magazine, you know, that sisters would give me the free subscriptions to because they wanted to be helpful and talked all about wonderful homemade cough syrup. How could I sit down and read that when I hadn't read my Bible? And so if I didn't have much time for Bible reading, I certainly was going to fast from books and magazines, as good as they are. And when I need a cough drop or a cough syrup recipe, I'll ask somebody specifically for it. So I also found that I needed to fast from sleep. That was really hard. But being a mom, it, it's really stretching, isn't it? Like, some nights you don't sleep much. And um, there were times when I was just like, Lord, this is really tough. And now you want me to wake up and spend some intentional time in prayer and Bible reading? Oh. But it was like the Lord just said, well, how much do you love me? Do you love me more than your bed? I had to say, yes, I do. Of course I do. I mean, I might not wake up an hour earlier than the children, but I can at least, you know, get out of bed. If I, I made a deal with the Lord often. Um, Lord, if you wake me up before my alarm, I'm going to give you the, that time. You would be surprised how many times he took me up on that, just 15 minutes extra. And I'd wake up and just like, boom, my eyes were open, and then I'd want to just roll over and go back to bed, and he'd say, whoop. Remember? <laughs> you told me you'd give me these extra 15 minutes. Let's have some time together. Okay. I'll fast my sleep. Um, we'll talk more about social media and, and our phones. Maybe that's something we could fast from too, but we'll get to that topic. Also, I want to say this. Um, sometimes I, I, I got bitter at God, like, how do you expect me to fast, especially food, when, you know, I'm just surrounded by food all day, I'm in the kitchen, I'm trying to feed a family, and um, it's just no fair. If I could go off, you know, on a mountain somewhere, then sure, I could handle this. And um, he just so graciously told me, Mariel, when I was in the desert, every single stone could have been a loaf of bread for me. I know what you're going through. It's okay. Do it anyway.
Journaling, um, I just want to mention it really quickly, it's not for everyone. For me, it's really, really important because for me, I haven't really learned a lesson until I've written it down. Other people, you know, they don't really learn a lesson until they write a song about it or whatever. But for me, um, writing it down is really powerful. We talked about writing prayers, that can be helpful. Um, it's not only a place where we can talk to God or express our, our feelings, but we can also um, start hearing from God. I have often started journaling my thoughts and ended journaling God's thoughts. And that's really special. It's a, it's a real good way to, to know God, um, to expose our hearts, but also to be safe. Worship, um, it's a pretty broad term, but specifically through song, uh, again, this varying levels of importance to people. Um, but singing is something that you can just incorporate it into life as a mom so wonderfully. You can do that with your children. It, it can alter the whole mood in your home if you just start worshiping the Lord and singing. Um, also, worship, family worship. If your husband is not making a priority of family worship, and if you have the privilege of homeschooling, which I did, then you can make worship part of your school day, and, um, it, and it won't get undone, left undone. Memorization. I think we all know how important it is. Um, also, this is something that you can incorporate into your school day. You can do it with your children. Um, I've been appalled at how bad my memory has gotten, even though I'm not all that old yet. Um, but yeah, it's just important. It's important to have God's word hidden in our hearts. So just do it. And discipleship, I mean by this, um, the need we have to all of us have um, a Paul, somebody who's a little further along that can disciple us. Um, you know, younger sisters especially, avail yourself of the wisdom of the older sisters. There are so many women in our midst, in your congregation, who have things they could speak into your life, but they are not going to volunteer it necessarily. I have found that the older I get, the less I want to volunteer because I, I'm starting to realize how much I don't know. I didn't realize that when I was 25. Um, and so the same thing probably goes for other older women, but if you younger ladies, draw them out, ask them specific questions, um, there's probably a wealth of, of information and wisdom there for you. But you also should have a Timothy. You should have somebody younger than you, no matter what age you are, that you are discipling, that you are pouring into. In For most of us, that's our children. And if that's all it is, is your children, then don't feel in the least bit apologetic. That's enough. If you are actually raising true disciples, it is going to take just about all you've got to give it. And um, especially if you have you know, a bunch of children, that they're, they're all at different ages, they all have different needs, pouring into their lives, if that's all you do for the next 20 years is a totally full-time job. But if that's not a full-time job for you, then purpose to go out and find somebody who needs to be discipled. And that should be easy enough if you're part of a, of a fellowship. There's usually somebody who could use your input. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears now and I'm gonna talk about um, the next bunch of slides is just benefits or um, the rewards of practicing the spiritual disciplines. Um, if we do, the spiritual disciplines, we will learn to embrace an eternal perspective. Um, Jesus was in the um, Garden of Gethsemane and his soul was troubled just like ours are at times. And he asked the Father to save him from this hour. Just like we often do, we say, oh Lord, you know, I can't face this, whatever this is. But then he did something that we can only accomplish if we are spending time at Jesus' feet, and that is he acknowledged that his trial 
had a purpose that transcended his own concerns. And he said, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Um, if we're spending time in the spiritual disciplines, we'll be able to say that too and, and have a, an eternal perspective on it. Without an eternal perspective, we will run from suffering, and with it, we embrace God's will, regardless of the personal cost. We will also learn how to evaluate our motives. So the question here I had in mind was, do I want to look spiritual, or do I want to be spiritual? Um, What's good about the spiritual disciplines, prayer and Bible study and memorization and fasting, is it's basically hidden. And so it guards our hearts against hypocrisy because nobody usually knows if we're really doing those things or not. Um, so, you know, we need to be painfully honest with ourselves, with our motives, and, and ask ourselves, am I, am I more in, in concerned about making good impressions or with pleasing the Lord? Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Spending time with the Lord, it helps us establish profitable habits. We will be under pressure what we have rehearsed in our leisure. I'm sure some of you have seen that come out. If you're in the habit of running to the Lord on a normal day, you will run to the Lord when the crisis happens. But if you're not in that habit, you won't. You'll fall apart. And um, this has really come to me as far as the habits part. Um, we had my uh, mother, stepmother-in-law living with us for five years until just recently, and she has dementia. And so I've done um, kind of a lot of study about dementia recently. And when everything is stripped away, from us, including our minds. The only thing that we have left is that which we have done repetitively. It's our habits, and those will still be there for us. I'm just going to read this quote. It's from um, a, a doctor and a Christian who works a lot with Alzheimer's patients. It says, one woman I was testing to determine whether she had Alzheimer's disease asked to stop the testing. She said to me, my memory is just fine for what I need to do. And I asked her a little bit more about her routine. She lived in a nursing home, and she would get up each day and walk to the chapel, sit down, and pray and read through scripture. Then she would walk back to her room. She remembered the Lord, even if sometimes walking back to her room, she got confused. So what she had made a habit for was still there for her. My stepmother-in-law, I mentioned already, she had a habit of gratefulness. And um, she has totally lost her mind. Um, she just doesn't remember most of her entire life. But she is always grateful. And she will tell you, I know I've had a good life, even though I can't remember it. So she is so gracious. That's a habit she made. Hudson Taylor, um, he made a habit of trusting God. And when, even when he was just facing extreme circumstances, it was there for the, him. And it comes out in this quote I really like from him, when I cannot read, we've all been there, it's like your brain is so fried you can't even read. When I cannot think, when I cannot even pray, I can trust. Make it a habit. If we learn to trust, then we will also learn how to enter into rest. Rest and activity are both really equally important to God. I like the, the line in the song that says, Blessed Trinity in whom alone all things created move or rest. Um, I'm just going to give an example of why I feel like it's so important to learn to rest. Um, I probably about a year ago, maybe two now, I'm not sure, 
had what I would consider a very close to burnout time. Um, the needs in my home were extreme. I had two old people living there, um, my mother-in-law, my stepmother-in-law, and all the children and everything. And my brain was just starting to, to tip. <laughs> Um, and one particular day, I had organized a homeschool event, and there was just all sorts of ladies and their children all in my home, and I was sitting at the table, and I was trying to be gracious, I was trying to ask relevant questions and be engaged, and my brain was just like, done. And it, it really scared me. I, I just wanted to run and hide and cry because I thought I was losing my mind. So I realized that my brain needed rest and everybody left the homeschool event and, and I knew I needed to rest my brain but I just didn't know how. And so I would suggest that you all learn how to rest your brain. It, it'll be different for each person. I tried reading like Hudson Taylor, it didn't work. I tried praying, I tried listening to the Bible, I even tried listening to, to basic classical music. It was all too intellectually stimulating. I had to, I finally stumbled across um, Dan Musselman. Isabel later told me that Dan Musselman, who just does like piano music, no words, um, he prays for the people who are listening to his music. And I didn't know that at the time, I didn't know who Dan Musselman was, but my brain just started to be renewed as I just sat there and stared out the window. So at that time, the Lord directed me to a book. Um, it's called Zeal Without Burnout, Seven Keys to a Lifelong Ministry of Sustainable Sacrifice by Christopher Ash. Um, and I learned three things from that book. There's a difference between burning out for Jesus and living sacrificially for the Lord. The latter is sustainable. We can live sacrificially for the Lord on a long-term basis, but burning out for Jesus is not sustainable. And burnout looks heroic, but it's very counterproductive. And when you burn out, everybody that was doing everything around you is going to stop what they were doing so that they can prop you up. It's not at all productive. Um, so it might look like, oh, what a hero you are, but it's really not going to help, and it's probably fueled by your carnality and your pride. So learn to rest and learn to say no. And the other point that he made in that book is, I'm dust. I was made from dust, and I'm going to return to dust. And even though right now I have health and a mind that works, I am still dust very vulnerable, very close to disintegration at any moment. And I need to just be reminded of that sometimes. And I need a Sabbath rest, sorry, for things I learned. And so I started taking a Sabbath rest. That may not be Sundays. For most of you moms, it's not Sundays. It, that's not very relaxing, especially if you happen to be like the pastor's wife or whatever. Um, so find other ways to have a Sabbath rest. That might be nap time when your children go down. Make yourself not do the laundry. Take a Sabbath rest, you know. Or maybe I, what I started doing was during that particular season, I said to my family, one night a week, Right after supper, I'm not helping with any cleanup. I'm not putting you all to bed. I'm not getting up with grandma during the night. I'm going to sleep in the cabin. Goodbye. And I did that for a few months, and it helped. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we need to be, be willing to do those things for the sake of everybody around us who are looking to us. The other thing, I'll just throw this in here, is that I think sometimes we need to be okay with sitting before God in stunned silence. Um, I got that thought from Ezra where he, he rent his garment, he plucked out his hair, he sat down astonished, the King James says. Um, and sometimes I've felt like this. And sometimes we think that's a sign of defeat or it's a sign of psychosis. But I think it might be exactly where God wants us sometimes. I think of the Queen of Sheba. She was in the presence of Solomon. And um, yeah, she had no more spirit in her. That's sometimes where God wants us to be, just unable to, to rally. And that's OK. So we need to learn to rest. We also need to learn to cultivate the secret place Psalm 91.1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall, be, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
So what does that mean, the secret place? I think of it as being um, intimate with God. We need to know God, but we also need to be known by God. And um, that can be scary. You know, maybe there's someone in this room who, just that word to know, the King James uses it to, to talk of intimate relationships with a husband and wife, you know. It's the same word here. Um, but the Bible says that we're, we're a daughter of the king, we're a child of God, we're a joint heir with Christ, a sister of the Lord, a bride of Christ. These are really intimate family relationships that he's talking about. So when we're spending time with God, we need to be okay with cultivating that kind of an intimate relationship. And I don't mean anything weird here. I just mean that we need to be, God needs to be the first place we run. Um, don't run to your girlfriends. Don't run to your children. Don't run to your husband. Don't, you know, when you're facing something, get in the habit of running to God. Let him be your bestie, the first one you go to with, with your intimate um, concerns and, and cares. I think if we if we cultivate that secret place, if we learn how to run there, then we can withstand the betrayals and the shortcomings of other people. Jesus did this, you know, he longed for the companionship of men when he was here on earth, and that's why when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he invited Peter and James and John to be with him in his hour of agony, but um, they, they let him down. <laughs> they fell asleep, he was alone with God, and we will be too. And um, similarly, uh, when we are, when things are going well, we want to share that with other people. But Jesus was our example in that too. It says when men were approving of Jesus and, you know, saying, Hosanna, he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man. So the only way that we'll be able to follow Jesus' example and not be swayed by people's betrayal or their praise is to be intimate with God and to cultivate that secret place. So we also need to prepare to be a living sacrifice. Um, dying is an event, like I mentioned earlier, but living as a sacrifice takes discipline and it's a daily thing. It needs to be maintained over time. It takes kind of a different kind of grace than just dying once. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Trials are not strange. They're actually commonplace. And um, we need to just be okay with that. Um, and that takes time in the spiritual disciplines. We often feel like suffering is a test of God's faithfulness, and we kind of, you know, Lord, where are you when I need you? But, but suffering and, and trials, they're, they're a test of our faithfulness. They're a test of our character. Um, yeah, so we need to learn to be okay with that. And I realize that, um, I know I am a very pampered Christian, compared to so many who have walked through so much. Um, so being a living sacrifice is just sometimes being really honest about how little it takes to make me irritable, um, how very little it takes to ruin my day, um, or, you know, yeah. If I, if I feel like it's not taking much to ruin my day, it probably means that I need to be spending more time with the Lord and recommitting myself to being a living sacrifice. So practicing the spiritual disciplines give us an opportunity to exercise our willpower. Good soil is a soil that possesses sufficient intelligence to recognize a wise choice, that's important, but also sufficient willpower to accomplish it. And if we're not exercising willpower in our daily lives, it's not going to be there for us when we really need it. Must is a really, it, it's actually an easier taskmaster than should. 
And um, this is what I mean. If you must do something, if your child falls down and, and is hurt, you run to them because you must. You drop everything and you go. Um, if your church has certain standards and if you didn't do them, you would be excommunicated, then that's a must and you're going to make it a priority, right? But there's lots of things that fall in the, into the should category and I think the spiritual disciplines are that. Nobody's going to enforce um, or, or, or even know if you spent any time this morning reading your Bible. So it's a should. Um, and it's easy to put it on the back burner because it's a should, it's not a must. So what you need to do is rally your will and see the shoulds of life as an opportunity to exercise that willpower muscle. Um, there's a lot of examples in the Psalms um, of this. Psalm 77, I'm not going to turn there right now, but look at it later if you want to. It's a really good example of the power of the will in a renewed spirit. Um, if you look at verses 1 through 9, I think it's David is the writer of that psalm. He's rehearsing the trouble, the confusion, the despair. But then he, he switches, and in verses 10 through 12, he starts exercising his will, and he says, I will remember, I will remember, I will remember. And then he goes on to say, I will meditate, I will talk of your doings. He just starts exercising his will. And then the rest of the psalm just kind of ends on a much happier note with him being more positive. Also, um, the thought, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. That's repeated a couple times in different places in the Psalms. It's like the renewed spirit talking to the soul and saying, come on, you can do it, exercising the will. Lastly, um, for this section... Practicing the spiritual disciplines will help us to create a legacy. I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of small. If we did the best we could with what we had, that fact will gradually become more and more apparent to our children as they become parents. But if we consistently made soft decisions and selfish choices, that too will become increasingly obvious to our children as they view their past through the lens of adulthood. What is your legacy going to be? Are they going to look back and say, well, mom, she meant well, but she made a lot of soft decisions. They're going to see it once they're adults. What's your legacy going to be? What are you going to inspire them to do? I think the goal is to live without regret. As I look back over the last 30 plus years, um, I do see that there was higher ground. There were things that I could have done and I didn't do, and there's things that I did that I could have done a lot better, but I think I can honestly say that I was walking in all the light that I had and that there was never a time when God prompted me to do something and I said no. I think we can all have that kind of a testimony that when we get to the end of our child raising years or whatever we have in front of us that we can have no regrets and know that given what we had in the moment we didn't turn our backs on God and we did all that we could and um, yeah I think when we give God all that we've got he multiplies our efforts and I think when we do our very best he comes along and he perfects it um, and that has definitely been my testimony Okay, we're going to switch gears and talk about some of the possible hindrances or pitfalls, things that can draw us away um, from being spiritually disciplined. So the first one is ignorance. Um, I think as women, we tend to feel limited by what we were taught or how we were raised. But I think God wants to give us everything that we need um, he's not limited by what 
we were or weren't taught. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah 33 says, call unto me and I will answer thee. We're all familiar with that part of the verse. And then it goes on to say, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So when we call on him, he's not going to tell us what we already know or what the good things we were raised in. He's going to tell us the things we don't know. And so that doesn't need to be an excuse. What a blessing. Idle idealism. Um, I don't know about any of you, but for me, it's easy to say, oh, if I were a missionary to Timbuktu, then I'd be faithful. Or if my husband was a pastor, then I'd really press in and be faithful. But um, that's all just idle idealism. He wants us to be faithful right here, like with the dishes and the children and the diapers and the whatever, right here, right now, where we are. That's where we need to be faithful. And if we really would be willing to go to Timbuktu and to die for Jesus Christ, then why don't you just wake up early and pray and read your Bible? It's really much easier and it will be productive for you. So sometimes we, we need to be willing to go, but sometimes we need to be willing to just stay and be faithful. Another really big stumbling block is um, disorganization. Has anyone seen my time? Um, I don't want to meddle here at all, and I know people have different ways of organizing their time, but I do want to just say a few things and that is that for some, being good stewards of our time is easier for some people than it is for others, but we can all learn how to be good stewards of our time. And I have been really greatly served by being scheduled and organized. Um, when I'm exhausted, my brain is foggy, then my schedule tells me what to do next. And when I was in the midst of morning sickness and I would open the refrigerator and nothing looked edible to me, um, if I had a meal plan, it told me what to make. And when I feel stretched thin and pulled in all kinds of different directions, it, it helps to have a regular place where the school books are kept and I can just go there and find them. It, it's not that I'm an organized person because I am some superhuman. I am an organized person because I am very weak and frail and my organization is my crutch and helps me get through my day. So I, I think that's the purpose. Now there's a, there's a need for balance there. Your schedule should never become your god. Um, it's, it's not the end of the world if your schedule isn't followed. There's a place for spontaneity and flexibility. Those are both very important things. But if you don't have a routine from which you are flexing, then you're not being flexible, you're being undisciplined, right? And I think children do best with a, with a schedule. I mean, children are going to be fussy sometimes, but children that have a rhythm to their day, they know when to get hungry, and they know when to feel sleepy, and it just makes them feel more peaceful. So... Also, the other thing about organizing our time is that those things that are limited are precious. The reason gold is precious is because there's a limited supply. When you know gas prices go up, it's because something's happening in the Middle East and, and gas is becoming precious. And so anything that is limited is precious. But we all have the same amount of time. So how do we teach our children to steward their time and treat it like something precious? None of us knows exactly when our time's gonna run out. Um, so how do we teach that? Well, I think the way we teach that is by organizing our time. And um, I'll just give you an example. The other day, this just hit me. I was um, about to jump in the shower. Um, it was something had come up, and I hadn't been able to go through my morning routine um, the way I wanted to, and I knew I, I was going to be running late for 8 o'clock group time, which is how we, we start our school day. And so I just shouted out of the bathroom, guys, we're going to be a little bit late on, on group time today. A little bit of flexibility needed. And the reason I did that is because 
I taught my children that I value your time. Otherwise, they would have been all sitting there at 8 o'clock, and I would have been running five minutes late, even if it was just five minutes. They're sitting there twiddling their thumbs waiting for mom. I value their time, and so I'm going to tell you ahead of time that we're going to have to flex a little bit. And it also teaches them to do the same, to value the time of others, to treat it as something that needs to be stewarded. All right, enough of that. I've got lots more notes on all of these things. but. <laughs> um, Social media, in quotes, because it's a buzzword, um, social media is not the only distraction. Um, any kind of technology can be a major distraction. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of different opinions on the use of technology. I realize that. Probably a lot of them represented here. I think all of us would agree that um, technology is not simply good or bad. So I think what we would all agree on is that um, it does need to be managed. And I use my phone a lot. I have a smartphone. It's my calendar. It's my to-do list. It's my calculator. It's my Strong's Concordance. It's my encyclopedia. Sometimes it's my shopping cart. I use it a lot. But what I don't want it to be is something that it's not my entertainer my escape. I don't want it to be what I grab when I'm bored or I'm discouraged or I'm lonely. I want my phone to stay a tool and not become my toy. Because if that phone is allowed to be my toy, it may soon become my addiction. And it's really just a matter of priorities. There's plenty of good things you can do on your phone. Um, podcasts and blogs and people across the country that you can be in communication with. It's just a question of can you afford this right now? Um, can you afford to stay in touch with the person across on the other side of the world? Have you talked to the people in your home yet? Have you talked to God yet today? Um, you know, just prioritizing your time. But smartphones are not the only um, distraction. You know, books can be a distraction, magazines, hobbies, sports, your health, all kinds of things can, can take the preeminence in our lives. So we just need to be careful of that. Doubt and disappointment. So sometimes when we're practicing the spiritual disciplines, um, I found this particularly the case when I'm fasting, I lose my resolve because I'm not sure, was this my idea or was this God's idea? And I think of Peter when um, he was really eager to demonstrate faith and um, Jesus came walking on the water, like we talked about earlier, and Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come walk to you on the water. And so he jumped out of the boat and he started walking on the water. Why did he start to sink? Because he started to doubt. And I do the same thing. I jump out of the boat, and then I go, whoa, was this my idea? Or was this God's idea? And in Peter's case, it, it wasn't God's idea. I mean, it was his permissive will. He said, sure, Peter, come. But Peter initiated that, and, and he jumped out of the boat. So I just find that I need to be very careful not to add more to my list than God is adding to my list or my husband is adding to my list. Um, I, I find it's really important to prioritize him, H-I-M with a capital for God and him, my husband, um, and not they. You know, that elusive they, well, they say we should do this, and they say we should do that. Um, you know, just kind of silence the they sentences and, and, and ask what he wants and what he, your husband or father, or whoever your he is in your life is. Um, the other thing we need to look at when it comes to doubt is, am I trying to prove something? by doing the spiritual disciplines. The spiritual disciplines are not a remedy for a guilty conscience. If you're finding yourself, you know, like, oh, I gotta pray more, I gotta spend more time in the word, I've gotta memorize more scriptures, another chapter, you know, are you driven by a guilty conscience? First John 1 John 1.9 tells us what to do with a guilty conscience, confess and repent and allow God to forgive you and to cleanse you. 
but the spiritual disciplines are not going to take care of your guilty conscience. Also, disappointment. I'm not going to have you turn to this, but make a note of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I think, is just a beautiful encouragement for especially those that are raising teenagers, which is really a place where we start hitting disappointment um, head on, I think. Um, There's lots and lots of things that disappoint us. But sometimes when you get to the place where your teens are starting to make choices for themselves, it's just like, oh, Lord, wow, what happened? What went wrong? I tried to be so faithful and so intentional and did such a good job training them, and now they're making bad choices and they're becoming their own people, and what am I going to do, you know? And we can turn away from God and say, well, why should I bother, you know, spending time in prayer? Look, you know, what's happening? So... In chapter 4 there of 2 Corinthians, um, in verse 1 it says, As we have received mercy, we faint not. At those times we need to not faint. Verse 5 says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ. We need to not take it personally. We just need to remember, this isn't our idea, we're preaching Christ. And verse 7 says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, You know, we're imperfect, and our teenagers start to realize that, and they sometimes point it out to us, and that's okay. We're earthen vessels, right? And then it says in verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. That is death to the parent, life to the teen. And um, I find that that just helps with disappointment. Also, Acts 28, 24 says, and some believed the words which were spoken, and some believed not. That was Paul talking, or it was just after he was preaching, and in Acts there it says that some believed the words that were spoken, and some believed not. And um, Paul's a better preacher than I am, I'm sure of it. And he had people that didn't believe and didn't follow. And not only that, but God is a much better parent than I am, and God has had lots and lots of rebellious children all through the ages. So, um, yeah, don't let that be a huge um, disappointment to the point where it it keeps you from fellowship with God. One last point on that. Um, I think as mothers, as wives, as women, part of our calling is to just do the next thing. Um, Joseph of Arimathea was a very good example of that, I think. In John 19, we read about how after the crucifixion, Joseph would have felt the same disappointment of that all of the disciples were feeling, like we thought he was the Messiah and now he's dead. Um, talk about disillusionment and disappointment. But he didn't just run away and hide and cry um, like a lot of the other disciples did. He went, he begged the body of Jesus, he prepared it for burial, he provided a a place of burial, and he took the body there. He just kept going and did the next thing. And I think as, as women, that's what we need to learn to do. Spiritual snobbery. What I had in mind here is that God is not obligated to make us feel his presence all the time. Um, We don't, we shouldn't be spiritual snobs to the point where it's just like, well, I'm not going to spend time in devotions because right now I'm just in such a dry season and I don't feel his presence anyway. You need to do it anyway. You just need to keep going. There are times when I sit down with my Bible and it's just fresh and and I'm getting new insight and it's exciting and it's wonderful and that's great. But I still need to open up my Bible and at least read one chapter when it's totally dry and God feels totally distant, we just still need to keep going and trust the process. Go through the motions and trust the process. I just want to touch, I don't know if this is totally related, but it seemed like a good time to put it in. Um, On the topic of of emotions and how we feel, I have found that sometimes I have 
just this underlying low level anxiety. Now sometimes that's due to hormones. But if you don't have a hormonal explanation for that, and there's just like this low level anxiety, I found that it's usually that God is trying to get my attention in one of two areas. Either there's something God wants to change in me. So I need to ask him, Lord, what are you putting your finger on? What do I need to confess? What do I need to change? What do I, you know, what is it that you want to change in me? Or there's something that God wants to change in somebody else, and he wants to do it through me. And so he's giving me that little feeling of anxiety every time I think about my certain child. And so I have to say, okay, Lord, what are you trying to say? What do you want me to do in regards to that situation or whatever so that you can either change something in me or change something through me? And if we're quick to check our conscience and we're quick to do whatever the Lord tells us to do, even if it's really small and simple, um, or if it's big and hard, then we don't really need to live with that low-level feeling of anxiety for very long. We can clear that up. All right, old and gray, we've come full circle. So um, you've all probably heard of Corey Ten Boom. And um, she was just an amazing woman. She preached the gospel, encouraged others when she was in a Nazi concentration camp. And then afterwards, she traveled the world teaching others about the power of forgiveness and telling her story. And it just hit me all of a sudden once that she started all of that when she was over 50. Like She didn't go to the concentration camp until she was in her 50s. And then she had a 30-year ministry. So it is never, ever too late to start. God can certainly take you from where you are and and move you forward. Um, Yeah, it it may be that you look back on your life if you're old and gray um, and you say, oh, I've missed all my opportunities. I just didn't do a very good job when I was a mom and I have so many regrets. And, And I understand. I totally understand. But, you know, you may be at the very beginning of your life's work what you will go down known for, like Corey Ten Boom, may not have even started yet. Um, you know, we, we often talk about giving God the best years of our life. Who are we to determine when those best years are? It might be when you're in your 20s, but it might be when you're in your 60s or 70s. Just determine to give God whatever you've got. And, you know, sometimes as we age, like I mentioned, we, we tend to be very aware of what we don't know, and so we're maybe a little bit more reluctant to open up our mouths and to teach, and we become a little bit less dogmatic, if you will, because life has just softened us a little bit. Um, that's okay, but do recognize older ladies Um, sisters, we are called, we are mandated, the Bible tells us to teach, and so um, whether it's comfortable or not, if you're an older woman here, you're, you're in a season where you are called to teach the younger ones. And um, we need to show God's strength to this generation, the generation that is surrounding us right now. That was a lot, so I want to just give you a couple pointers for going forward in faith. Um, First of all, identify the biggest area of need. If, if anything I've said today has raised a standard or brought to your mind things that you could be doing better in, just identify what that biggest area of need would be and don't try and tackle it all at once. Um, yeah, I've noticed that there were several things said already this weekend by different speakers that I think um, all of this ties into. If you've heard the same thing in two or three of the sessions already, maybe that's what the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on for you. So just look at that one area. Set concrete and attainable goals. You know, if you're not spending any time on a consistent basis in intentional prayer, do not start even with 15 minutes. Start with five and do it consistently and, and, and just, yeah, be successful with five minutes before you try and bite off more than that. Focus on his sufficiency and not your inadequacy. 
you know, Moses, he basically, when he was given the assignment from God to lead his people out of Egypt, he, he said, you know, I can't do this. I can't speak well. And God basically said, I know. <laughs> I made your mouth, and I know exactly all about you. So just go do it anyway, you know. And don't look at your inadequacies. Look at my sufficiency. Um, really, the 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 easiest way to be successful in the Christian walk is to recognize that we're dead and that our life is hid with Christ in God. And, and our Heavenly Father is not in the least bit um, surprised by our inadequacies. So if we just allow the Lord to change us and to use us, then we can relax because we're just the channel, right? And um, he's the teacher. All I need to do is, is sit in his presence and become a better Christian. And then when I stand up to go do whatever life requires, then the extra I've received from him is what's going to splash out onto all the people around me. I'm just the channel. And um, I'm not responsible. It takes all the pressure off. And then lastly, tell someone about it. Um, a quality decision usually starts with a willingness to talk about it. And it's usually maintained by a willingness to be accountable to someone. So if there is something that God is putting his finger on, then be willing to talk about it. Tell someone. Lastly, please, 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 please don't leave here overwhelmed. Please don't say, well, Marielle says that we are supposed to fill in the blank. Um, yeah, there is no spiritual bar. Um, these spiritual disciplines, they won't save you. And I didn't come here today to place this heavy burden on you and have you go out feeling overwhelmed. I wanted to lift up a vision. And so, um, yeah, I hope that comes across. It's, it's a vision of leaning into him when the going gets tough. We are going to fall. Somebody said this recently, and I liked it. When you fall, just make sure you're falling towards Jesus, not away from him. You're going to fall, but fall towards him. And, yeah, we're not going to get to heaven by accident. Um, Jesus called it a narrow way. He said, few there be that find it. But we, we need to believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So... The whole point of all of this, of the spiritual disciplines, <clears throat> of being spiritually disciplined, is to be faithful. That's the word that just keeps ringing in my mind, is faithful, faithful, faithful. I may not do anything great for God, but I can be faithful. Um, different speakers already brought this out. The, the first evening, is his name Kevin or Keith? He brought out being mature. Um, Brother Joel, he brought out being an overcomer. You know, just now, Brother Philip, he, he brought out being a pillar in the church. And he said, brothers and sisters, you can be pillars in the church. You know, we can be faithful. We can do this. But what does it look like? What does faithful look like? Faithful is not complaining. Faithful is not fainting. Faithful is pressing a little bit past comfortable. Faithful is refusing to make soft decisions that pamper the flesh. Faithful is putting God first and others next. Faithful is serving our local congregation. Faithful is being a godly example to our families. Faithful is rising early to read the Bible. Faithful is spending time in prayer. Faithful is fasting. Faithful is dying to myself and allowing Christ to live his life through me. So may God grant that each one of us can be found faithful. Okay, ladies, we have just a few minutes here for questions, comments, input from you. And I feel like my plate is really full of things to think about and digest from this. And, yeah, there's so many things we could talk about, but maybe I'll let you, if you have something that you'd like to share here just raise your hand and i'll quickly bring the mic to you we'll just take a few minutes for this so something that i really struggle with you talked about getting having burnout 
and sometimes you just have to take like a Sabbath rest. And I would love to have an older woman teach me because a lot of times I feel like, and it could be the enemy, but I feel like it's selfish to do that. Like I feel like when I feel at my wits end, I really should be leaning into God and saying, I can't do this. Today I can't, I need to, I need you. And so it's, I've really struggled with that. Like, you know, and I know sometimes it's guilt and I know guilt is not from God, but even just taking time to say, okay, I just really need this. I just, I really deal with selfishness and thinking that that's selfish to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, and there's the narrow way again. And if, if you're not sure if you're falling into the selfish ditch or the trying to be heroic and never say no ditch, um, if you have a husband, ask him. Sometimes husbands can be a really marvelous resource that way. God's ordained it that way. Um, also, ask others around you, other sisters in the Lord, um, but ask the Lord, too. Um, but, but sometimes it's really helpful to ask other people, you know, have I been making a habit of, um, of saying, no, I can't do this? Because that can become a ditch, too. Um, but I know what you mean. I, you know, sometimes you can get into the overachiever thing and you want so bad to, um, to do the right thing that it, it feels selfish to give yourself any time. And I'm not talking about me time and pampering yourself, but you know, sometimes just being really practical, um, yeah, can be helpful. You were saying how uh, we should not let our guilty conscience be the driving force. Um, for thinking we need to pray. So one thought I had on that was that we should cultivate a hunger. If we don't have the hunger, um, ask God for the hunger. And that's a journey I've been on years past where I just ask him for the hunger. And that is the driving force that takes me to the Bible and into prayer and just seeking his heart. That's good. Yeah, to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Amen. Let's ask for the hunger and thirst after righteousness. I'll just say one quick little thing that's helpful with journaling, too, is even when you write down your prayers, it's helpful because you can go back and see where God answered it mm. and then write in the answer. And you might find it was three weeks later or three months later or just a few days later, and it's an encouragement that God really does answer those prayers. Amen. I don't know if you can give some advice on this, but one thing I really struggle with is I'm, you know, I have a chronic disability and, you know, finding, finding the time and finding, you know, what happens when that schedule gets disrupted, not by my own wanting or, or, you know, the children or anything like that, but it's purely, you know, I end up in bed for a couple of days because my illness has taken over. And then I often find, myself, you know, then my, my mind goes down that path of, you know, that guilt, I don't want to say the guilty conscience, but I get very overwhelmed, you know, the house isn't clean, mm -hmm. the, the children haven't had baths, you know, mm -hmm. it all falls to my husband sometimes, and, and I don't know how to grapple with that, and I mm -hmm. don't know how to come to terms with, this is my lot in life, and how do I, how do I make, use that for his glory? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, and that sounds like a hard situation. And yet, I think the way you can make that a beautiful thing is by not giving in to complaining or self-pity in the midst of it. If you can say, Lord, the fact that I'm laying here in my bed for the last two days, I'm just going to make it an act of worship and obedience to you because I didn't ask for this disability, and it's not in my power to take it away. And so do you just use it. Make it a beautiful thing with gratefulness. God bless you in it. <laughs>